Hi, everybody. Mark DeJesus here, helping you, equipping you to experience healing, freedom, and transformation in your life. I'm all about the life of the heart and helping you to be awakened from your heart, experience healing in your heart, and have true transformation from the heart. And in this series, what I want to do is I want to give a couple video episodes on the subject of spiritual blocks to the life of your heart because I spend a lot of time focusing on your heart. A lot of times we can focus on the mind or focus on knowledge and understanding, which is great, fantastic. But when we get to the heart, we get to the core of who you are. We get to the center, the seat, the, the seat of your spiritual life, the, the seat where everything flows out of it. Proverbs tells us, watch over, keep, guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of your life. We get to your heart, we get to the root system of your life. And so I'm going to do a series on spiritual blocks to the life of your heart. These are areas that infect your root system. They can often be subtle. They can often work in ways that sneak in. And I want you to allow this series to just be something where you can, in a healthy way, examine yourself. Not in a condemning way, not in a shame way, but in a sobriety I love the biblical word sobriety because it's not just speaking about not being drunk. It's, it has a meaning to it of being alert. You're not being paranoid. You're not being afraid. You're not condemned. You're just awake, alert to your senses. You're alert to what's going on in your life. You're alert to what's happening in your family, in your world. And so these are some areas that I think we need to be aware of in our root system. When I speak of the heart, I'm talking about your root system, the root areas of everything that influence everything in your life. And that's what God's really after. When he gets there, then you're going to have a real relationship with him. But you must know the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy and infect the life of your heart and create toxic areas in your root system. Because if those areas get infected, then it will manifest in many, many different areas of your life. And so the first one that I want to get to is unbelief. And I think this is, it needs to be addressed up front because it's one, when you look at the root system of all the problems and all the battles and all the things that you face and struggle with, unbelief is a theme in everything. If you want to go, hey, I want to get to the root problem in my life, somewhere there, it is empowered by unbelief. There is a area there that has been, uh, belief has been infected, faith has been infected, and now there's an unbelief that has settled in, and it's now causing a toxicity, a block, a limitation. So if you look at all your, your fear issues, your brokenness issues, or rejection issues, or uh, heaviness, despair, all those areas, somewhere in there, there's an unbelief that wants to be at work to keep you in those places. And so what you have to understand is when you look at the things you battle, you have to ask yourself the question, where is unbelief infecting this area? So you say, well, what is unbelief? There's a lot of different ways we could define unbelief. We'll first look at belief. What is belief? Well, it empowers our ability to walk in faith because it's a confidence, it's a trust, it's a reliance. And so each of those words get challenged in our walk. They get challenged in our journey, our confidence, our trust, uh, having a confidence in or reliance on. That builds our sense of faith. And anyone who's walked with God in any amount of time, those areas of confidence, trust, reliance, those things really get attacked in your life. And so when it comes to unbelief, if I was to define unbelief simply, because I'm all about simple and practical, unbelief has a lot to do with the inability to be convinced, persuaded, or to have confidence in something in how God thinks and how he works. It's an inability to be convinced in how God thinks and how he works. And so when we have belief, there's a confidence, there's a reliance. When unbelief is there, there's a, uh, there's a sense where we lose that, 
that confidence, that childlike faith, that childlike trust. And I find in my journey, I don't know how you feel about this, but this is what I've seen, is that a lot of us start off at the gate stepping out and believing and having a great sense of optimism, right? You go and get married or, 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 or you get you believe in Christ, you step out into your journey, and there's a great sense of expectation. And then you get hit in areas. Then you get hit in relationships. And you get hit in certain expectations you had that didn't work out. And it's like, now what? And so the unbelief wants to sneak in and infect, and it manifests in a lot of ways. It can be cynicism. It can be a loss of childlike faith. Just that simplicity of, man, I just, I just believe. There becomes a loss of optimism. You're just not as optimistic. The Bible talks about hope deferred, making the heart sick, right? That sense of like, Ugh, I don't know. Fearful projections become more of a dominant theme. Negativity, a sense of reactionary doubt that constantly comes in. And then we slowly develop our own sense of safety, right? What does it mean to be safe? What does it mean to have our sense of control? So now we kind of begin to create a fortress, but really what we're doing is we're surrounding ourselves with self-protection because when you believe, you have to put yourself out there. You've got to trust. You've got to put your faith in God and believe in who he is. And here's the key, his involvement in your life. Unbelief seeks to put a limitation on your thinking of God's involvement personally in your life and how he's at work. So what gives unbelief power is our desire and need for certainty, right? We want to just have a sense of certainty of what's going on, what's happening. We want evidence. We want to move in a way of what we think we can handle, we have expectations. We have a great sense of control. In fact, many of us operate out of our woundedness and brokenness with a high level sense of control. If you say, well, that person's really controlling. If you see someone who's very controlling, their control shows the level of brokenness they're operating out of because it gives them a sense of certainty, right? Because underneath unbelief, are broken places, disappointments, hurts, areas of rejection, areas of pain. And I gotta tell you, in this day now more than ever, we're in a constant battle where the temptation is to not believe and not stretch yourself. Now, my role here is not to try to analyze your theology. There's many different streams of, of believers that, that listen to my resources or teachings what I'm not talking about what specifically your theology of belief of what God can do and not do. Then we get all of these arguments, right? What I am getting at is do you get to a place where you're no longer stretched in your belief system? Because many times what we do in our disappointments and what we see is we pull back and we just don't believe for the impossible anymore. And so our belief muscles get worn out. They get, in some cases, torn down, and we lose that sense of expectation. We lose that childlike faith. That's why Jesus took a little child and said, unless you come to me like this child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And how many of us start off the journey with that childlike expectation, arms open, and then over the years, our arms start to come in, and next thing you know, they're folded, we're guarded, we're walled up. We don't have that innocent expectation anymore. And then people start to say, where's God? Where is he in this? Where's his involvement? And so the unbelief destroys your hope. Hope is your spiritual vision. It's how you see. Every day when you wake up and you face your day, you operate out of the hope you live in. What is the hope? It's what you see. It's where, where are you headed? What's God's involvement? What's the picture? Hope is like a picture, your divine perspective. And when unbelief infects it, you don't need much hope. You're just doing whatever you can get by in the day. So then your faith becomes limited. And then when, when certain situations meet you, they meet the unbelief that's there. And so you just don't have any gas. You don't have any sense of, of how to meet this. 
And so I bring this up as the number one block because it's involved in everything. And it's especially involved in your disappointments. And I want to urge you and really exhort you in one of the biggest things I have noticed in my life and my family's life and people I've helped in, in churches and, and believers I've interacted with, one of the biggest things that takes out believers from their overcoming posture is deep, deep disappointment. And how we handle disappointment is going to be very key in the days and years ahead of us. The season we live in is disappointment is one to take people out because they are often sudden. There are times that things come to you that you never expected. There are certain expectations. Disappointment often hits us hard when we expected God to show up for us in a certain way, and it didn't seem to happen. And so what we're tempted to do in a sense of control is develop the narrative of what we think happened, what God did, didn't do, the reasons why, and we create a whole narrative surrounding a situation. And a lot of times, we just don't know. In disappointments, the truth is we just don't know the full picture of what happened, of what was going on, of what was really happening in the spiritual arena. We just don't know. But our sense of brokenness needs certainty, right? So in the sense of a need for certainty, we need answers, we need theories, we need perspectives. And in that, we develop agreements. And they become these statements Maybe God doesn't do such and such. God doesn't. And now out of that broken place, you have some evidence. You have some evidence that are in the physical arena of some things you can latch onto. The problem is that is, is not the situation. The problem is that unbelief is coming in to infect you from being able to believe in what's possible. And so Whenever we see unbelief, you struggle with unbelief, I struggle with unbelief, we all do, to different degrees and different levels. Underneath the unbelief is a disappointment, is a hurt, is a place of woundedness, and it's actually a place that God needs to heal. That's why I am so passionate about helping people to experience what? What do I say all the time? Healing, freedom, and transformation. Because we all need healing in areas of our hearts. And if you don't think you need it, then you need to reassess. Because when I speak of healing, I'm talking about God's nature having an impact on an area of your life that's not been touched by his character and who he is. Because if we don't allow God to do this work, that unbelief grows and it'll grow slowly, but it'll infect our root system Before we know it, we're just in a a life that we can control now. And now we don't need God. And this is a very, very big problem in modern civilization because now we start to develop a real man-centered life. Like we, when we look at certain people's lives, they can even say they're believers. It doesn't even appear they need God. By the demonstration of their life, it doesn't even look like they need his involvement in their life. Because their day is filled with what they can control, what they do. And and there isn't that sense of trust and dependency anymore. No more stretching. Because it's just too painful. It's just too painful. And the modern church doesn't know how to deal with pain. We've become very weak in our spiritual heart muscles. It's become too much. So we numb out, we check out, and we just deal with what we can control. And live life out of that. And so... I want to share share with you a passage from Mark 11 because this is very challenging. Jesus said to them, have faith in God. The disciples were just amazed at what they were seeing him do. He said, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I find that when we look at a passage of scripture like this, we do a lot of like explaining around it. It's like, well, you know, it says this. And and a lot of times Jesus said these point blank statements because at the end of the day, we need to develop 
our sense of belief of being convinced in God's ability to be involved in the very moment that we're in right now. And your life, the war that you're in, is all seeking to every day just chip away at the confidence of God's direct involvement in your life. And Jesus makes a simple statement. Sometimes we we look at this like, well, you know, believe, but sometimes you got to, he's saying, man, you could look at a mountain. You can look at that situation. You can look at circumstance. And you say, yeah, I did that. I did that. And this happened. And it didn't work out. There's the disappointment. And so many times what we don't realize is belief is a muscle. Faith is a muscle that we're developing. And it's not about, well, that didn't happen because you didn't have enough faith. I, I urge you to preserve your hope and preserve your belief is to don't make black and white blanket statements about disappointments of the past. We got to leave room for mystery because we're all in a growing journey. The Bible says we see through a glass dimly that even though we have the glory of Christ within us, there's still so many aspects of the journey that, that, that are foggy. And so what that is meant to lead us to do is to allow God to become a deeper place in our lives where we learn to connect him. We want the formula. Well, I did this, this, and this, and this didn't happen. And really, those moments of disappointment are a call for us to go deeper in our relationship, face our pain, allow God to heal us, to strengthen us. And so, in Luke's gospel, Jesus said this statement. He said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets... They will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. I hear believers say this all the time. They say, well, man, it would really help me if God would just appear to me. If I had an angel come to me or if I had a message or a confirmation or I need. And it's interesting because the children of Israel, of all people, they had the greatest levels of confirmation and huge miracles happen over, 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 and over, and over. And what do you see in their journey? You see constant unbelief. An absolute miracle happened, and the very next day, they're already in unbelief. So oftentimes in our disappointment, we need God to show us something to get us back into the game. And he's saying, listen, if they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not, there, there is an inability to be persuaded within them that even if someone rises from the dead, you're going to go, well, that person wasn't even dead after all. Eh, you know, maybe it was because the doctor's just, eh, eh, there's just a cynicism that will swell within you. The Hebrew writer warns us of this. A lot of the instructions in Hebrews are really good last day's warnings for overcomers. He says in Hebrews 3.12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart, of unbelief. He calls unbelief evil. And if we say, if, if we were in our journey and we go, yeah, I'm struggling with this area of unbelief, you say, well, that's evil. We'd go, oh, no, no, I'm not evil. I don't have evil in me. This is, you know, I'm just, I'm just struggling. And I get it. I've said that too. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it evil, but the, the scriptures say here that unbelief, it, 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 it by nature cultivates an evil heart in your life. To do what? to cause you to depart from the living God. Now, just think about that for a second. When we're talking about unbelief's work, what's it wanting to do? Create a sense of distance between you and God. You ever get, you know, you ever get as a, when you were a kid and your parents disappoint you and you'd go in your room and you would just kind of give them the silent treatment and you don't want to talk to them because you're mad at them? We do that with God a lot, right? because we're disappointed, we're experiencing heartache. And so the goal of the enemy is not that God's leaving us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But rejection comes in and creates a sense of separation where we feel separated. And so if we come into agreement with that separation, now we're feeding an unbelief that's going to spiral us more and more. That's why Paul, in his writing in Romans 8, he said, I am persuaded, or I am convinced, neither death nor height, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, shall be able to, 
separate me from the love of God. Now, people read that passage over and over again. They quote it and they say it. But the key there is his statement. I am convinced. There's his belief. Paul had to come to a place in all his battles and all his journeys, all his disappointments, his shipwrecks, his losses, his his struggles, the thorns, the stoning, all that stuff. He had to come to a personal conviction. Nothing's going to separate me from the love of God. Your broken experiences will become real estate that the enemy wants to use to create a sense of separation, to inflame unbelief so that you don't thrive in that connection with Father God. So there are some things here that he's saying. Number one is beware. Just beware that unbelief doesn't seep in. And whatever you're going through, oh, my finances, oh, this thing relationally, or this struggle I'm going through, it's okay. It's okay. To, it's okay. You're going through a struggle because we're all in a journey. But just be aware. Be alert. Be sober that the unbelief doesn't take over. And he says, he says, <laughs> says, but this is key, and this is what you need. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. That's why we need to get around people that add life. And more and more believers that struggle with their unbelief, what's one of the things that they battle? They start to withdraw. They start to withdraw relationally. They stop connecting and being around others that sharpen them. And he says, exhort while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And that's what unbelief will cause is a hardness of the heart. Just not as open, just not as tender anymore. So if you're in a situation where you say, you know what, Mark, I I recognize I've got unbelief. What are some things to help? There's some encouragements I want to do to help unblock this and unclog this. Just three simple things because I... I like to give insight, but I also like to be practical. I think that you need to today, if, if you say, I got some unbelief, I want to work on it. Because you got to establish your want to. No, God won't force you. God's not going to someday just, you know, force his ways on you. He is a God who set the table for intimacy. He wants you to come to him. So I think first, allow yourself to process the broken places of your heart. Get to the root of your pain. Get to the root of the disappointment. Get to those places where the, the belief forms of unbelief, of where you wanted God to show up and it seemed like he didn't show up for you in the way you expected. Or you say, yeah, he didn't show up this way. That is a place we need to do exchange with God, that we need to learn to pour out that and be aware of the agreements that we developed because those agreements create a block. God, you never, or God, all these black and white agreements. Secondly, is I think we need to allow God to work with us where we're at. That's the great thing is that God works with us in our journey. He's not expecting perfection as, you know, perfection right now. He is inviting us to relationship and works with us. The, the man said to him in the gospels, Jesus, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief. That is a really powerful posture of vulnerability with God. It says, I believe, but I've got this unbelief here, and I give you the wounds of it because that, that unbelief is not going to be fixed with, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. You know, you just kind of say it over and over and over again. No, because it's, it's, a, it's a heart issue. It's a place of your heart that's wounded, that needs the healing balm of God to to come and bring comfort and healing where you need to sense his heart for you and his healing work to bring life and restoration. And so in that, my last exhortation is allow your expectations to mature, develop, and enhance. Maybe at one point you said, okay, God, you're, I believe you're going to do this. You got real specific with your belief in what God could do in your life. And that's great. And it didn't happen the way that you wanted it to. I believe the next level for all of us is learning how to mature and enhance that I still have expectation that God works, but I'm I'm letting him evolve and work with me because I remember 20 years ago, I expected God to work in A, B, and C. And then as I went through stuff and went through the trials, went through, then I learned to get that enhanced. 
What does it look like for your belief to be enhanced and matured in certain ways? Not that you, that you still have the childlike belief, but yet your sense of expectation of God, you're giving room for what that looks like to develop. What does it look like now in my life and journey? where you're guarding your hope, where you're watching over your hope. Maybe you need to recover your hope. But I pray today that out of this video, God will meet you where you're at and begin to deal with the underlying root system that could be allowing unbelief to form and that you allow God to have a deeper work to invade those places in a powerful way and you'd be strengthened. And out of that, you'd be able to encourage the brethren. Jesus said the statement to Peter. He said, hey, buddy, Satan is going to come and he's going to sift you. He is going to come at you with everything he's got and he's going to sift you. There's going to be stuff that he comes at you with and it's going to like really, really wear away at you. And what it's going to do, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But what God's going to do is bring out, filter out some stuff and bring out the beauty of who I know that you are. And he said, when you, when you go through it, I pray your faith is strengthened. Jesus didn't say, I pray that you'll be rescued from all your problems. He's saying, I pray your faith will be strengthened. And when you've recovered, when you have like broken through, go back and, and encourage the others. And I pray that out of your story of what you've been through, you're going to be an encouragement to others. So I pray this is an encouragement to your life. If this stuff is helpful in any way, go to markdehasius.com. Would you click on the donate button and, and support the work that we're doing? We're so grateful that these resources can be supported by people who just want to see others healed, freed, and transformed. And it's a blessing to be an encouragement to your life. Be loved, live healed, live free. Talk to you soon.